As we have discussed in the last slide in the previous section, it is possible that you make programming mistakes while using semaphores. For example, instead of calling the uh, semaphores in the wait then signal sequence, if you just do it in the reverse order or if you forget to signal uh, the semaphore when you're done with the resource, you could easily uh, end up with a system where, for example, you have a deadlock because uh, the semaphore is never released. So, uh, using monitors, we define a new abstract data type to properly use the uh, synchronization mechanisms, also making use of the semaphores. Note that the monitor is an abstract data type, uh, therefore, it could be implemented in different libraries in slightly different uh, ways, but this is the generic concept of using semaphores. So the, uh, this abstract data type provides us a high level abstraction of how to make use of semaphores while entering and leaving the critical section. Uh, note that only one process can be active in the monitor at any specific point in time. And unfortunately, the uh, simple implementation of semaphore would not be as powerful as using, uh, sorry, the uh, implementation here, the straightforward implementation of the monitor here would not be as strong as the use of semaphores. So we will make some uh, improvements on this. So uh, the schematic view of the of a monitor is like this. The monitor is basically monitoring the critical section use, so uh, the use of the specific functions that implement the operations here. Uh, that's why we have the name monitor. Uh, each monitor has some shared data, which is actually globally shared between all of these functions here that implement the operations. And of course, you need to have a way of initializing those shared data. And to be able to access the uh, shared data and these functions, uh, the processes will go into a queue to enter the, the monitor. So there will be an entry queue also for the monitor where each item here in the queue is a separate process waiting. Uh, there will be uh, several condition variables we need to use. Uh, like uh, each for each uh, condition variable, we will have its corresponding wait and signal uh, methods, uh, which is called by the processes. Uh, to uh, enter uh, the monitor. For, uh, for example, uh, the, a process will first call wait on some specific condition X uh, until someone calls signal on that specific condition so that the condition becomes available and the blocked or waiting process uh, can continue. Uh, so, therefore, we will revise that uh, scheme as in here. Now, among the shared data, we do also have some conditions like X and Y, and each condition will have its own waiting queue in addition to the entry queue for the monitor. Uh, if a process P invokes the X, uh, signal on some uh, condition variable X, a, one of the processes Q that's waiting uh, for that condition will be released by the system. But if there are several uh, processes that are waiting uh, to be released, one question is which one is to be released? And yet another and more important question is if P calls signal uh, for some condition X, for which earlier had, Q had called wait. Now, which one should proceed? Should we uh, just pause P and let Q continue? Or should we let uh, P 
continue until it completes whatever it's trying to do in the uh, monitor. And after P leaves the monitor, let Q enter the monitor. So the first one is called the signal and wait, in which P waits until Q either uh, leaves the monitor, uh, the one that was released, uh, leaves the monitor, uh, or maybe uh, Q calls uh, wait on another signal. So that means Q is leaving the monitor in that case. And the second approach is called signal and continue, uh, in which Q waits until P uh, either leaves the monitor, it completes its task, or P calls maybe uh, wait on another condition. Both of these approaches have their pros and cons, and the uh, implementer of the language picks one of these to work with. Uh, for example, in, con uh, in concurrent Pascal, we have the monitors implemented with some compromise. So P is executing the signal uh, immediately. Uh, P, who is executing the signal, immediately leaves the monitor, and Q is resumed. Uh, we also have implementations in different languages like Java, C Sharp, and Mesa. So, for example, let's look at how the dining philosopher's problem could be solved using the monitor. So uh, remember, we had uh, some number of uh, philosophers who want to eat or think. Uh, in this example, we assume there are five uh, philosophers around a round table. So we remember had a, a, an array of states where for each philosopher, we have three possible states, thinking, hungry, and eating. And now we define also condition variables, one for each philosopher, okay, named self. So uh, any philosopher who wants to eat uh, will be calling the pickup uh, method or function by specifying its ID here as the parameter. When the philosopher is done with eating, he or she will call the put down function, again specifying its ID. We have the initialization function, which initializes each philosopher as initial thinking. And we also have a test function, again taking the ID of the uh, philosopher. So let's first begin with pickup. If a philosopher, remember each philosopher was initially thinking, now if one of the philosophers gets hungry and wants to eat, now you should first say, set the state of that philosopher to hungry. Remember, in the case of hungry, you're not eating yet. Uh, going into the state of hungry just shows your intent to go into the eating state. So that philosopher first sets its state to hungry and then calls the test function will come to the test function. And uh, after the test function, if its state is converted by the test function to uh, eating, in that case, this condition will be false. And therefore, therefore it will not call wait. Uh, uh, if its state is Something other than eating, which uh, was initially hungry, remember. And if you're hungry, you cannot uh, go to thinking state before eating. So a, a hungry philosopher cannot think before he or she uh, eats. Uh, therefore, saying not eating uh, actually means the state is hungry. It's equivalent to that. If it's hungry, that means test function did not allow this philosopher to eat. The philosopher should get stuck uh, on the condition by calling its wait function. Okay, so now let's have a look at what the test function does for us. So remember, what we did was we set the state to hungry, so we show our intent to eat and do the test by providing our own ID. Okay, that's also important. The uh, philosopher 
tests itself now at the moment. So what happens? The philosopher, while testing for itself, it looks at its right and left neighbors. If the other philosophers sitting on the left and right of that philosopher are not eating, and this uh, philosopher wants to eat, is hungry, in that case, since the neighbors are not eating, that means the chopsticks are available, so the philosopher can pick up both of the chopsticks at once, pay attention. This is different than what we did in the uh, previous slide, uh, previous videos, where you were picking the uh, chopsticks in some specific order, like first the left one, then the right one. No, in this case, you check for the availability of both chopsticks only if they're both available. If your both neighbors are not eating, then you pick up the chopsticks and you go into the eating state. If one of the neighbors is in eating state, since these conditions are connected with and, the philosopher will not be able to enter the if statement, the damp part of the if statement. Therefore, its state will remain at hungry. That's important, so keep that in mind. Since, it, now let's look at the case where uh, one of the neighbors is eating. Since the state did not change, it was originally hungry and it remains as hungry, the condition here will be hungry again, because state I is still hungry. Hungry is not equal to eating through. So the professor will get stuck, That sorry, that philosopher will get stuck in the wait function here. Okay, so this philosopher is uh, waiting. Why is that a philosopher waiting? Because someone else, some other philosopher, one of its neighbors actually, is eating. So the chopsticks were not available. That philosopher, hopefully at some point, will get full and want to uh, release both of its chopsticks because he or she is done with eating. So that philosopher will call the put-down method, again uh, specifying its own ID. Now let's see what happens in that case. Since that uh, philosopher has uh, now wants to stop eating, the state is changed to thinking, and the philosopher calls the test method again, but this time not with its own ID, but with its uh, with the ID of its left and right neighbors. So it's not testing itself, this time it's testing its neighbors. Let's go back to that test function once again. In the test function, remember, it, the inside the test function, i is whatever has been passed. So now, for example, it will be the id of the left neighbor, not for the philosopher who stopped eating, but the left neighbor of the uh, philosopher who stopped eating. Okay, so for that I value, uh, that philosopher is, uh, for the test function, you're looking again at the left and right neighbors. If the left neighbor of the philosopher who stopped eating has both of its neighbors in not eating state, at least the one on the right is now, we know, is in thinking state, so it, that will check also its own left neighbor. If they're both not in eating state, that neighbor now may start eating, hopefully. Can it? Let's see. This condition will be true. The third one will be true. And the second one is true because that neighbor was waiting uh, for the chopstick to be available. So. All three conditions are true. Therefore, I, which is, remember, the left neighbor, becomes, uh, it switches to the eating state. But just changing the variable is not sufficient. Remember, that neighbor 
was waiting on self I, but not that I there was the uh, condition variable of that uh, philosopher. You're actually signaling for that condition variable. So, in other words, when a philosopher who is done with eating switches to the thinking state, it also gives the option to its left and right neighbors to continue. Actually, one or the other typically uh, may continue. But in some cases, for example, uh, two of them uh, could also start eating uh, because they both could be uh, waiting for that philosopher to release the chopsticks because the other one for each neighbor was already available. Anyways, this uh, solution will typically uh, work, but unfortunately, it also may end up still with starvation. And the reason for the starvation is as follows. See, when a philosopher is done with eating, it's testing its neighbors in a specific order, left or right. Also, it really depends on your luck. You could be sitting between two philosophers who often want to go eating. So, you want to eat. You cannot because your left neighbor is eating. While waiting for your left neighbor to complete eating so that your left chopstick becomes available, meanwhile, the right neighbor starts eating. So when the left neighbor is done, you cannot continue because this time the right neighbor is eating. So you start waiting for the right neighbor. Meanwhile, the left neighbor again starts eating. So you're always waiting either for your left or right neighbor. And you almost never have the chance to go and eat because one or the other chopstick is always available, uh, always not available. Therefore, uh, it is possible that maybe not indefinite starvation, but still some philosophers might not get the chance to eat uh, when they want to in most of the cases. So, uh, unfortunately, this solution does not uh, solve that problem. How can we implement uh, the uh, monitors using semaphores? Uh, we can implement it uh, as follows. We will need a mutex, a binary semaphore, in other words, to protect uh, overall uh, the, sem uh, the monitor. Remember, we said only one process could be in the monitor at any time. So we need mutual exclusion there. That's why we need a binary semaphore there, uh, initialized to one. We will also need another semaphore, as we will soon see, uh, to check who goes next, uh, which process goes next when we have, uh, when we call the signal, which will be that uh, binary semaphore will be initialized to zero rather than one. And we need to count how many processes are uh, waiting in the next queue. Therefore, we will also need an integer variable, again, initialized to zero. So for each function f in the monitor, remember, for all these operations, you have a different function, these procedures p1, p2, up to pn. All these are those functions uh, that we want to uh, allow. So for each one of them, they will be implemented as in here. So as I said, uh, you need mutual exclusion within the monitor. Therefore, you should first wait for the mutex. Then when the mutex becomes available, you have the body of the function, whatever you want to do in that function. But before the end of the function, you should execute this if statement, which checks for next uh, value. It's checking for next count. If next count is equal to zero, that means 
there's no one else. In that case, you will come to the else part and you will release the mutex that you acquired. But if someone was already, some other process was already waiting for the uh, monitor, next count will be greater than one. In that case, rather than releasing the mutex, because the other one will continue, so we still need uh, mutual exclusion within the uh, monitor so that other other uh, processes do not enter the semaphore uh, sorry enter the monitor by mistake we just want the next one uh, to continue not the others therefore rather than signaling mutex we will keep the mutex in hand we had acquired with weight and just signal next so that the next one the process that was waiting to enter the monitor uh, can uh, enter. Remember, the next semaphore was initialized to zero. So if there's no one in the next queue, anyways, this would be zero. But if next count is greater than one, by calling signal on next, you just allow one waiting uh, process to enter uh, the uh, enter the uh, monitor so this way mutual exclusion within the monitor is ensured also for the condition variables uh, in we are still continuing with the implementation of the monitors using uh, semaphores pay attention so for each condition variable you should also define another semaphore Pay attention, for each condition, you need a separate uh, semaphore. So if, for example, our condition is x, let's call that semaphore x sem for the semaphore for x, which is, again, initialized to 0. And again, we need a count on that, so that's also initialized to 0. So if one calls the wait uh, method on x, we increment that counter. Uh, because we are going to deal with that, and at the end, as you see, we uh, decrement it again. If there's someone uh, waiting to enter the monitor, we signal next to allow it to enter the monitor. Otherwise, we release the mutex because no one is waiting, and this uh, process is uh, done with the condition. So you signal mutex, and uh, you put that process into the waiting condition x. Uh, so it will be waiting for the semaphore for that x condition, the one we defined here, which was, remember, initialized to zero. Now, if somebody calls signal, if x count is greater than zero, uh, that semaphore will be signaled. Therefore, the process that was blocked for that condition can now proceed and uh, we call uh, next uh, we call wait for next and also decrement the next count note that this is done if x count is greater than zero so the monitor implementation is better than uh, the exam for implementation in one uh, way and that is uh, even if you call x dot signal, for example, unnecessarily, uh, it will not be incremented more and more and more. Remember, we had that problem in the possible mistakes with semaphores. This uh, is done in a conditional manner by uh, making use of that count, so uh, you don't unnecessarily increment uh, the value of a semaphore in the case of a monitor. Uh, if several processes are queued on some specific condition x and x signal is executed, which of those queued processes should be uh, released for execution? First thing that comes to mind is an FCFS or FIFO order, but in most cases that might not be very uh, adequate. Uh, the conditional weight construct 
uh, can also be used for this. Where the wait method this time has some priority C specified. So according to the priority, the one with the highest priority uh, uh, will be released. The highest priority is typically represented by the way with a lower number. But generally the concept is let the highest priority process continue. So this way, rather than going first in, first out, you can go as uh, from higher priority to lower priority. But note that uh, as in all cases, uh, as in all priority-based cases, such systems may end up, uh, again, with the starvation this time, for the low priority processes, if they're uh, always high priority processes. Uh, also, it is possible uh, to uh, do the uh, request for some resource by calling it acquire by specifying some maximum time. So the process might say, I want resource R, but when I get it, I will be using uh, that resource at most for, for example, T time units. And when you're done, you call the uh, release. Uh, on that resource. Uh, so in that case, the acquire method will take some parameter time. Uh, if it's busy, it will uh, be waiting for that time and set busy to true. And when you say release, it will set uh, busy to false and then signal it. And initially, all resources are not busy. So that will be the end of this chapter. Please read uh, these sections. Uh, the section numbers and the chapter numbers are slightly different depending on which edition of the book you have, but uh, with the titles, you can find the correct sections.